Hey, everybody. Hey, can you hear me on the mic? OK, awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jesse August. I am a software engineer at a cybersecurity company called CybeSafe, which is based in the UK, but actually our co-founder is from South Africa. Um, I come from a psychology background and love to explore and understand the intersection of human behavior and behavioral science in relation to cybersecurity and secure software development. I'm also the co-host of a podcast and an avid member of the OWASP security community. Really, really excited to be here talking to you guys today, so thanks so much for, for coming to listen. Today I'm hoping that we can explore some of the uh, threat landscape changes in 2023 and also explore the challenges within web development and security. I want to really focus on like, the human aspect and put a behavioral lens on that and explore some of the concepts that we're going to come across in, from a slightly different angle. Similar to this morning's keynote, I don't have the answers to a lot of the problems I'm going to be presenting. I've got some ideas, but it's definitely something that I'm hoping that we can explore together. Um, I'd also like to discuss some of the strategies that we can use to overcome some of these issues. So if we try and imagine the world, a world where web applications are rife with vulnerabilities, where data breaches become rampant and exposing personal information and even uh, confidential corporate data skyrockets, identity theft skyrockets, criminals exploit credentials to wreak havoc on individuals and financial fraud escalates. If we can imagine what this looks like and the consequences as how they, and how the consequences extend beyond the digital realm to affect and disrupt our critical infrastructure and our transportation, our healthcare, and even national security. Unfortunately, we don't have to imagine too hard um, because a lot of what we're going to discuss today is, is already happening. But I do want to stress that I don't want today's talk to be all doom and gloom. I want us to explore some of the reasons why cyber attacks are becoming more prevalent and what we can do to hopefully, um, to hopefully remediate some of those. So according to IT governance, there have been a 953 declared incidents this year, and the total number of breach records has just come over the total of 5 billion. So web application attacks are involved in 26% of all breaches, um, making it the, most, the second most common attack strategy. I really want to think about or explore what we can do and how we can feel empowered to tackle these like, a, a seemingly insurmountable challenges. So I want to talk about our responsibility as the builders of technology. I think that if you truly care about the, the planet and, and your role as a builder of technology, you need to be user focused and thinking about the end user and their protection when you're creating applications. And security is the shared responsibility between all of us to protect people and their data from unauthorized harm. I know I'm preaching to the choir, I know you're all aware of this, but I just think it's really important to center how we are all part of the solution to resolving what is quite a scary time. We are ultimately, as builders of technology, we are the um, front, final frontier in terms of being the people that protect the world of apps and the world of the web. And it's all of our duty to ensure that we're doing all that we can to, to fight the good fight. So the reality is that the threat landscape is vast. We've had a number of talks today, and we'll continue to have a number of talks today that go into the very specifics and kind of different ways that this can appear. Um, and one of the things that I think can often be a barrier to us feeling empowered is that the threat landscape is constantly changing. It's really hard to keep up to date with those changes, and it's really easy to be overwhelmed with the doom and gloom perspective. So we're always having to adapt. We're always having to make impactful decisions without necessarily understanding how those are going to play out um, and how, how, yeah, the impact that that will have in the future. So. I think it'd be really helpful to have a look at some of the research that we've had come out over this year and try and see what we can pull from that and learn from that. One of the things I'd like to talk about is the PsyCognito report, the State of External Exposure Management report. So this research team aggregated and analyzed 3.5 million assets across its customer base between 2022 and May 2023. So it, the um, Sample data spans multiple industry verticals and has a mix of small, medium, and large enterprises across the globe. And one of the findings, one of the key findings I think is important to pull out is that 74% of the assets with PII are vulnerable to at least one major, uh, one known major exploit. And at least one in 10 of these web applications have one easily exploitable issue. 
On top of that, there were 70% of the applications in the survey were lacking um, WAF or um, encrypted connection, particularly HTTPS, and 25% of all of the applications surveyed lacked both. And then also, I think one that um, we'll discuss in a little bit more detail is that for every easily exploitable, critically severe issue, there were 133 easily exploitable, high, medium, or low severity issues. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important in a bit. But I want, to, I want us to focus on how, um, I think with this one, that the, every security team is always looking to prioritize and focus on the highest risk, most exploitable, critical, severe issues, of course, that makes sense. But equally, we all, all need to understand the importance of prioritization and the context around this, and we'll get into a little bit. So the start of 2023, we had ChatGPT unleashed onto the world, and the release of these mass market pre-trained um, chatbots in 2020, 2023 has been remarkable. Businesses have been eager to harness the effects of LLMs and are rapidly integrating them into their operations and client-facing offerings. Yet with the speed at which we've been implementing these, we've not really had a moment to pause, or at least some organizations haven't had an opportunity to pause um, and think about the security implement implications of implementing this technology. So a lot of applications have been vulnerable to um, high-risk issues. This week, it turned, one year, it turned one year old, and we've seen incredibly heavy adoption, but how, ha, what have we seen in this year from a security perspective? There have been a lot of high-profile incidents where uh, companies have been seeing leaks and people putting personal data into ChatGPT and similar large language models, um, and we've seen that there's been a kind of reverse in being able to, um, people have kind of had to take a step back and realize that we're not necessarily um, thinking security first when we're implementing this new technology. And with the sneak state of open source security in 2023, we saw that AI code generating tools have achieved blanket penetration and are now being deployed by 92% of organizations. So with more research into how LLMs have been used in tech development, Cyberhaven did um, have detected and blocked requests to input data from 4.2% of the 1.6 million workers at its client or companies because of them leaking confidential information. What that looks like in one case, there was an executive who pasted the firm's 2023 strategy document into ChatGPT and asked it to create a PowerPoint deck. And in another case, we had a doctor input his patient's medical name, uh, patient's name and medical condition and in order to draft a, a letter to the patient's insurance company. Now, I think these are great examples of kind of the failing of making sure that everybody's aware of issues and also uh, there's so many things to dig into here but um, I do think it's important that right here we see this as an example of the system as a whole it's not these two individuals that have caused a problem it's it's um, what could we have done as a whole as this organ how, what could these organizations have done to prevent this from being possible um, and also, it's not all bad. We have seen some great security developments from LLMs. There are some positive um, movements. I've seen um, Asankia Sharma did an incredible keynote at the OWASP um, conference earlier this year, which was about how we can use LLMs and generative AI to fix software vulnerabilities. And we saw OWASP themselves release the top 10 for LLMs. So it, there are some good things happening. It's not all scary. Um, but really, with that context of all the things that are going on, all the increase in, in attacks, the, the number of breaches, the um, implementation of technology before we've necessarily got the guardrails in place to, to, um, to, to prevent the, the catastrophic impacts that it could have, how do we, as security experts, make sure that we um, are doing the best for our, our users and the people that are using our technology? We hear the term shift left a lot, and it's something that in, I think the term originally started about 20 years ago. Um, it just quickly, is, it's considering and implementing security practices earlier on in the development stage. So if we think of um, typical release cycle, making sure if we're shifting left, we're ensuring that we're considering security implications from the beginning, from the design stages, before we've deployed, um, before we're monitoring things. However, um, Despite this, we're still seeing a rise in, in issues, and it's, not, it's clearly not the kind of 
way that we can solve all of our issues. We've been doing this for a long time and the stats are showing that we're still experiencing all of these problems. And even this morning's talk on offensive security and um, kind of continually building up your defenses, there is a diminishing return in implement implementing this. I believe most organizations have shifted left or are continuing to shift left and we're still seeing similar problems. So what else can we consider? Um, there's a GitLab global survey from 2021 found that only 27% of developers saw security as a critical part of their role. And even despite all of our efforts in the security community to shift left, I think that's quite a worrying statistic. It shows that people still aren't quite feeling empowered, still aren't feeling part of the solution, and are ultimately developing things that, um, yeah, don't, they, they're not seeing themselves as an agent or responsible for de delivering securely. So um, what are some of the reasons that this could be the case? If we look at the sneak state of open, so open source security from 2023, we see that false positives and automation overload, 61% of respondents saw automation has increased false positives. And if we think about what those false positives can do to developers and people that are trying to um, kind of work to deliver and innovate and build quickly, we can see that this alert fatigue, the exhaustion, the mental health challenges, and the team turnovers can be a reason that people are feeling less um, willing to engage in security practices. So alert fatigue in cybersecurity is when yeah, professionals are overwhelmed by the number of alerts, and it results in decreased productivity and um, a waste of, of time in terms of having to filter these things out. So, in these cases where we do see the false positives, I believe that we are missing genuine threats and we could be negatively impacting the security of our applications. In trying to highlight things that we need to focus on, we can kind of overwhelm our teams and make us feel less able to focus on the things that really matter. Um, so I think that the issue here, or one of the issues that I want to explore, is about making sure that we're, as security teams, aligning with engineering and product being embedded into engineering and product, but not just in a way that we are putting our restrictions and our guardrails for them to passively adhere to, but in a way that means that they feel like they are agents of the change, they feel like they are able to contribute to building securely, and they feel a part of that. Um, so if we, one of the things I think we need to do is try to empathize more with what a developer and a product team's goals are. If we think about the DORA metrics, that's quite often what a, a developer, development team is kind of um, marked up against. Like that's how their performance is measured. How quickly are they deploying? What's their lead time for changes? What's their change failure rate? How long does it take them to restore uh, a service? And so all of those things mean that they are um, incentivized to build things quickly, rush things out. And you can see how there's a friction against what it is that we as security professionals are trying to do. We want things to be considered. We want there to be cohesion with best practice and make sure that we've considered all the, the aspects that are important for remaining secure. So we can see already that there's kind of a disconnect between our goals and their goals. So if we have that pressure as developers to iterate quickly and we have the pressure on speed, then what are some of the things that we can do um, insecurity. And I think this is where we come back to making sure, addressing that 27% of developers that don't feel like it's their responsibility, making sure that they feel, um, they feel that they are a part of the solution and that they feel that they are um, responsible. I also think that we should have a lot less of an emphasis on shaming developers and end users and anybody who happens to be that day's cause of the issue. Um, it's not enough for the, secure, for the controls to be in place, and I don't think that the adversarial approach can really lead to lasting change. There's tons of research out there that shows with phishing simulations and um, compliant uh, yeah, security awareness training that is uh, kind of remedial, all of those things lead to guilt and shame and kind of disengagement with best practices. If you're going to make somebody feel bad for what they've done, they're much less likely to be able to empathize with you and understand what you want to do and, and want to help you to do that. Um, and yeah, one, one example of this is a report from Avast which found that 40% of employees at small and medium-sized organizations who mistakenly click on a malicious link and know they will be held potentially liable um, are much less likely to report an incident. And I think we can extrapolate that to development. I think that people um, who are responsible for breaking 
things in production, causing issues in production, if they feel that they can't report that, if they feel that they will be like reprimanded for that, they're much less likely to report it earlier and they're much less likely to want to understand what's happened and learn from it. Um, yes, so again, the people who, who are responsible for these things can often feel, well, responsible is a strong word, the people who are involved in these things can often feel the guilt and shame. And um, in, in this same study by Avast, they found that if there was shaming, there was lasting negative impact for the employee well-being and for the damaged relationships. So we've gone through some of the things that haven't worked. Um, I want to go through some of the concepts and strategies we can try and implement to um, understand the people that we are trying to protect, that we are trying to involve, and what the barriers are that they're experiencing. So we spoke about uh, a little bit about the implementing guardrails and that's kind of adding more and more layers to defense and maybe that's not the thing that is working. So um, I really want to talk about the Peltzman effect and I love that there was a car example in this morning's um, keynote as well because I'm going to kind of extend that a little bit. So the Peltzman effect was introduced by an economist called Sam Peltzman in his st study titled The Effects of Automobile Safety Regulation. And what this was was in the 1960s, there were a ton of new automobile safety measures, such as having to wear your seatbelt, improved car safety technologies, and Peltzman wanted to study how this impacted the number of deaths in, in the automobile industry. But ultimately, what he ended up finding was that there was no decrease in death rates, and it led to the exploration of the theory that because drivers felt safer, they were therefore more likely to take risks which consequently increased the likelihood of a car crash occurring. So even though these people were safer as a result of the technologies introduced, they were aware of these technologies and it led them to make riskier decisions and take bigger risks. So while safety measures like guardrails and, and kind of the, the preventative measures we're putting in place, the defense systems we're building, while they themselves can certainly help to lower risk, the Peltzman effect suggests that when these safety measures are implemented, people tend to increase those ris risky behaviours. So what does that look like in security? If we think about the, the more tools we if we think about more tools we introduce, um, this is a study which has not yet been released but is due for publication in 2024 by Aranas et al. Um, they found that security tools were positively related with the computer being infected and the risk level of the computer and the malware infections. They found that the thing that reduced risk was not tooling, but actually the security activities that the organization engaged with. So there was a direct correlation, a negative correlation between a number of security activities within the org and the risk of the computer being infected and the risk level of that computer. And then similar to the Peltzman study, the people that have more tools exhibited more risky online activities and the risk level of the computer was, was increased. So the overall conclusion of this study, which I really recommend you go and have a look at, um, it's, it's fascinating, it's just that the security tools are not sufficient to protect users from malware. Um, and there's things we need to do instead of just blanket applying security training uh, kind of, uh, yeah, the, the guardrails that prevent people from building things. And then if we go back to the examples we were talking about with, with ChatGPT and the people that were inputting that sensitive information, I think that also comes down to the, the whole systems thinking. And system one thinking, we've got our brains fast, auto automatic, unconscious, and emotional response to situations and stimuli. These can be in the form of abs absentmindedly reading text on a slide or um, knowing how to tie your shoelaces without a second thought. And then the system two, the slow, effortful, the mode in which our brains operate when we're trying to solve complicated problems. This is when you're trying to park your car in a tight space or you're trying to determine the quality to value ratio of your lunch. So something that I think we need to do is introduce the, well, make it easier for people to encourage, uh, engage in system two thinking. And in order for people to feel like they can make those slow conscious decisions, they need to be informed about the risks. They really need to understand the implications of the behaviors that they are, are making, and they need to feel a part of the solution. If somebody doesn't feel like they have any responsibility, why would they slow down to think, and why would they consider, and why would they engage in that, that um, system two thinking that will mean they won't input their 
entire 2023 business plan into ChatGPT. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is community. I know that I'll be preaching to the choir here because I have seen and heard of some incredible initiatives done by the people in B-Sides and the B-Sides community and then the security and tech community in Cape Town. But um, I really think that we all have a responsibility to drive more people into the cybersecurity industry. I think that we can kind of engage and galvanize a lot more interest if we get involved with community initiatives and um, especially if we try and involve those from diverse backgrounds because I think that as we all know, um, the, more, the more schools of thought and the more alternative perspectives that you have in, these, in um, technology, the better, more resilient and, and more uh, innovative that technology will be. And it's also coming back to that issue of making sure that everybody feels like they are an active participant in security. So yes, um, we're gonna be moving. I really think it's important that we focus on moving people from people in society from feeling like passive recipients to active participants. Um, yeah, forgive me for these slides. I thought there was nothing more dystopian than using AI generated um, images and they do, the faces are quite scary. <laughs> um, so now I wanna talk about some strategies we can use to engage people. I think that education and awareness for too long now has been like a beating stick something that we use to tell people off with and um, is a tick box thing that can really rarely work. And I wanna talk through a couple of examples later that, of ways that we can make it a little bit more fun, a little bit more engaging, something that hopefully helps people to feel like it's not such a scary thing to get involved in. And then also no code, no code tools. If we truly wanna shift left and we wanna be involved in design and we wanna be involved in earlier stages of the process in terms of building technology, then we need to have non-technical advocates. We need to have security champions within our product team and our design team. And so we need to meet them where they're at and make sure that we're engaging them with the sources and resources. Um, we need to source resources that are entry level. And then again, coming back to responsibility, it's this step further than shifting left, rather than just inserting your presence in those places, actually help them to understand what their role is within that, within that part. And then context, I think so often within the security community, we're great at coming together and sharing what we learn from um, massive breaches and incidents and notable um, examples of, of kind of attacks, but we don't really often share that beyond our own community. And I think context is so key to making people, pe making people feel included, making people feel interested and giving them that opportunity to explore things in a more like current and, um, yeah, interesting way. So strategies for engaging people. And I think another thing that we often overlook is the impact of early career security or development professionals. I know that a lot of people now are coming into software engineering from boot camps, and I'm one of those people. I did a boot camp quite a few years ago now. And I remember when I did that, there was no talk at all about security. I did not know what secure web development was. Um, we didn't touch it. And I think that that is quite often a little bit of a scary thing when we join an organization and we're expected to have all of this knowledge. So I do think, again, there's a responsibility for us as engineering teams, as security teams, to make sure that we're meeting them where they are and empowering them early. And then also part of this is making it safe to make mistakes. I think we want cybersecurity to be something we can explore. And I don't necessarily mean, you know, making mistakes is in pasting in your entire business plan into chat GPT. But I do mean that you can have the, the opportunity to, um, yeah, ex explore and, and have the safety of the people around you and the systems around you, which mean that you can learn from those, op learn from those mistakes. Um, and finally, I'm just gonna talk about a couple of tools I think are really cool for getting people involved in, getting people interested in cybersecurity. Um, uh, for non-technical individuals, there's Threat Dragon. I think threat modeling is an incredible thing and it's massively underused, especially um, in those earlier stages by non-technical people. And Threat Dragon's a free open source threat modeling application built to be simple, fun and engaging, and it's got the cutest mascot I've ever seen. So that's a bonus. And then um, the OWASP juice shop. So this one I love for, uh, I've taught courses around this and also just introduce this to junior developers. It's a great way to introduce the OWASP top 10. Um, it's it's an intentionally insecure, vulnerable app um, that you can kind of play around with and break and attack. And it really helps to learn about the practice of security testing. 
So it's got loads of real, world, real life examples and um, yeah, like they're intentionally planted and the user is supposed to be able to exploit them and find the underlying vulnerabilities. And I think this is an example of something bigger, which is that you want to make security a bit more fun. You want to have that, that kind of light-hearted nature to it because as somebody entering the industry, as somebody looking from the outside in, it can seem quite impenetrable in terms of um, accessing it and being involved in it and feeling like you can do it. So um, anything that makes it easy, fun, a little bit more appealing in terms of I can be a part of this, I think is really important. Um, so to summarize, I think that shifting left alone will not address the fundamental human issues that we're facing. I think we need to address the human element of secure development. And um, I think the main ways we can do that is by is empathizing, engaging and understanding um, the people that we're trying to involve and help um, to overcome the challenges that we're facing. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Yeah, I don't know if we've got any questions. Can you tell us more about your, um, the way you engage with boot camps? Or can you tell us a little bit more about how you engage with boot camps and with um, previously excluded people? And for example, uh, I run a non, non I run a non-profit organization and would like to engage on that for South Africa. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I've worked with an organization called Coding Black Females and have created um, like courses around the OWASP Top 10. And I think one of the things that was really, really impactful was making it relatable and bringing it back to real world examples. So for every concept we were trying to teach, we had a notable example of an app that they were familiar with, like um, the, the, the Facebook hack where they could use the elevated privileges to become an admin of a group and kind of understanding that all that was was modifying a URL. Um, just like bringing things back to their most basic example and in a way that is, is like planted in the reality that they know, the context that they understand. And I think when you humanize mistakes and you show them for the, sim the, sim like the, the more simple ones, at least, for how simple they are to solve as well, then that, that makes people feel like, oh, okay, I, I can understand that concept. Now I'm not so scared of approaching the, the, more, the more complex ones. Yeah. But I'd be really happy to talk to you more about this afterwards as well. Well, thanks so much for the talk. Um, this is maybe a bit less of a, a question, more of a comment, or my my opinion, because it's something. This is also something I've thought about. Um, I've worn a developer hat uh, uh, for a long time, and um, I think half the problem is the education aspect for developers. But I think there's a lot of developers who have a very good idea that you know leaving exposed boxes online is probably not a good idea, but there's that rush to get a product out, and um, and they're coming up against their their goals not being aligned with true security of the of the organization. Um, and my basically my opinion is, and I understand there's some issues with this, but developers need to push back and actually say. Hang on, we can't we can't develop with this um, infrastructure as it is. We need to actually include security controls, and it is going to delay the project deadlines and what was promised. Um, but the issue is, developers feel like that's at odds with job security. <laughs> so I don't know. I think that's really the challenge that needs to be solved. Is and I think you've kind of touched on this. Is it's making that okay to push back, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any other follow-up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think it, that that's a struggle of like communicating, having the business need understood for why security needs to take precedence when you're building and developing and iterating on features, right? And I think that's, a, that's also an example of a communication issue because the people who are putting the pressure and, and making those decisions aren't necessarily understanding 
the implications. So 100%, I think there needs to be more advocacy higher up um, and also f f yeah, from the engineers and developers to be able to stand up to that. But yeah, that's, that's one I'm yeah, not sure how we, can, how we can solve always. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. So I have a question more to, to your, your question. I'm not a developer, but if there were tools, I mean, you, in a lot of talks, they talk about guardrails. I think you, got, you mentioned as well guardrails. If you, you know, developers, as you said, you want to get your application out as quick as possible. And sometimes developers, I've got friends who are developers, and you know, they, a lot of them are introvert, and they're too scared to put up their hand, and you know, because of fear of jobs, if there were tools that you could really integrate into your, tool, into your tools that you use that aren't forcing you to code securely, but guiding you, maybe introducing information to say, guys, you know, we've picked up that what you've developed isn't as secure. You have some training information that you can click on potentially that you can go and investigate at your own time. Or potentially say, well, you know, with maybe not ChatGPT, GPT or um, large learning stuff, but if there are tools that could help without you having to understand security, click on something, implement a secure code component, and then go on. Does that make your life easier versus you going to have to study and become a security expert? Because I mean, you guys aren't security experts. I mean, everybody I can see, everybody's nodding. Developers aren't security experts. You're not there to be security experts, but tools that can really integrate into your platforms so while you're coding, guide you, give you some insights, pop-ups that says, you know, guys, you have some training information because we've picked up that you've maybe left us in your own time, go and investigate why you should be considering coding in a different way or potentially inputting secure code. Does that make life easier for developers versus going become security experts? Yeah, I think, I think there's a balance between that, right? And I do think there is, as much as I did say that a lot of the time false, posit false positives can be detrimental and there's alert fatigue, there is an importance of automations and like vulnerability scanning and things that can be used to support and, and catch, the, catch the things that developers ne not, won't necessarily see. Um, and that can be used as well to support a developer's use case and, you know, it took us longer, or we're going to need longer because there's X, Y, and Z that we now need to remediate and, and think about. Um, yeah, but that is, that's that, that dichotomy, right? That constant like, trade-off between those things. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks very much, everybody.